we're in the middle of this sermon series, End of Me, and we've been talking about this idea of what it means to fully be at the end of ourself. Sometimes you hear it said as like, I'm at the end of my rope, or I'm, I'm feeling like I'm at rock bottom, or I'm just at the end of my own physical capabilities. Um, my mom used to say, I'm at the end of my, I'm at my wit's end. Um, I don't know if that's because she was frustrated with us as kids or like why that was, but you're feeling like you're just at the end. You've got no more room to go. You've got nothing left in your tank to give. You're at the end of yourself. And what happens at the end of us is if we're able to submit in that empty place to God where he's able to carry us to from there. And so we've been looking through the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And our first week, Pastor Dan uh, started us off with talking about blessed are those who are poor in spirit. It's like an encouraging message coming right there. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then Pastor Evan talked in week two and three about blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. It's not just that we can be blessed because we're in mourning, it's because we have the best comforter in the world who wants to be there with us in the place of mourning. So as we come and submit ourselves to him, we are blessed in those seasons. And last week, Pastor Evan talked about blessed are those that are meek, for they will inherit the earth. Our inheritance church is so massive. Those we come and we humble ourselves to God and we say, God, would you be what is at the end of me? We get to inherit the earth. If you've missed any one of the sermon series so far, it's been an incredible series and I'd encourage you, check it out online. You can look back at the messages if you've missed any or if you're away from us, you can always check in on live stream and be able to watch the sermon series if you're not able to make it here on a Sunday. Um, but if you've missed any, I would encourage you to look back and, and check out the series that we've been walking through because we've just been kind of walking through all of Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes there. And so today we're going to pick up in verse 6. And in verse 6, it starts out by saying, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And if we stop there, we could think, well... I forgot breakfast this morning, so I'm a little hungry. My stomach's like making that like swishy, gurgly sound, so I am blessed because I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. If we stop there and we just think about the, the thought of being hungry and thirsty, we, we can all kind of relate to that. You know when you're hungry. Your body tells you you're hungry. It will audibly tell others as well, that you're hungry. So if you also forgot breakfast this morning, your neighbor will know soon if you're hungry. Because your body starts to react to that, and it starts to tell you, feed me. And it starts to to long and need to be nourished. It physically, audibly, tells you that it's hungry. When your body is thirsty, you have a physical reaction. Your throat gets dry, your skin dries up, you get headaches. If you go without water for a long period of time, your body will respond to that and tell you, I need something to drink. And so there's like this physical reaction that we have to hunger, and in that, we have a physical reaction to then what we've been taught as kids to fix the problem, we have to eat. Or to fix the problem of thirst, we have to drink something. And so our body is naturally telling us that where there's a cause of hunger, it needs the effect of food to help it. And we all can relate and know what that feeling is to be starving, hungry, and just be like, I could eat a whole horse right now. Like, I'm so starving. I could eat an entire turkey dinner to myself. I'm just starving. We all know what it's like to be hungry and to long to be filled. In that, often what we do is we take whatever we can get first to fill ourselves with. And so it's not necessarily that if I'm starving, if I'm at my end, if I can't go without one more bite of food, I'm not going to wait to cook a gourmet meal for myself. I'm going to eat whatever I can eat first. I'm going to fuel myself with whatever I've got at at my reach and grasp for. There's a story of of a shark that was found that was dead. And when he was found dead, they they opened him up to see what had caused his death, to see if it was something in the environment, to see what, what was the cause of this mammal's death. And so they opened the shark to find that he died of starvation with a stomach full of fish. 
And you think, well, how could that possibly happen? If he was full, why did he starve? And it's because the fish was actually inside a barrel. And so although he reached out to eat the very thing that should nourish his body, it looked like the right thing. It might have smelled like the right thing. It tasted like the right thing for him. Although he filled himself in that moment with what he thought was going to be nourishing to him, with what he thought would fill him up and sustain him and keep him going, was the very thing that starved him to death. Often we do this in our spiritual life. We are quick to fill ourselves and to try and fill an emptiness and to fill a void with anything that we can grasp for to fill ourselves with. Or we look for the things that look like the right thing to fill ourselves with that apparently look like what we need and what we're lacking. And we fill ourselves up with all of the stuff that we think we need to fill ourselves with. But see, there's the rest of the verse that we need to keep reading here. Because it's not just about blessed are those who hunger and thirst. In a spiritual sight, it's blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not just enough to know what it is to hunger and thirst after something and to know what it needs to fill yourself up. It's, it's actually knowing that in the moment of your absolute desperation of hunger, where you need to turn to and focus your hunger towards. Because if we're willing to focus our hunger towards God, he's able to bless our state of emptiness And he's able to fill us with his righteousness. And the Bible says that when we're able to turn to him and seek him and ask, would God, would you fill me with your righteousness? Would you be what fills me? Would you be what sustains me? It's only in that moment that God can actually bless our state of empty and fill us up. If you go to dinner with a full stomach, you're not going to enjoy the dinner that's provided for you. The same way that if we come to God and we've already filled ourselves with something else, we can't enjoy the goodness that he wants to give us. We need to be able to put ourselves in a place that's sometimes a little bit uncomfortable. It hurts to feel empty. It's hard to feel like you're lacking. It's uncomfortable to feel lonely. It's uncomfortable to feel the hurt that you're feeling in relationship. It's hard to face a a moment of feeling like I need to depend on somebody else for something that I can't do for myself. That's a hard place to put ourselves. But the word of God says that he wants to bless that, that space for us. That's where he wants to get a hold of us and be able to fill us. And not just enough so we'd be okay. He wants to fill us to a point where we would never hunger or thirst again. God wants to bless our space of emptiness, but we have to be willing to direct our emptiness at him in order for him to fill it. Um, There are so many options in our world today that we could choose to fill emptiness with. Emptiness looks like bored, Stressed, tired, weak, hurt, lonely. And there's so many ways and so many options that we have in our society today for what we could use to fill those voids. There are so many things right at our fingertips that in the morning I can choose to roll out of bed and grab my Bible and fill myself with the Word of God. But often, here's like omission of Joel. Often I roll out of bed and the first thing I reach for is my phone. And how often do we open our phones and we start to scroll through social media or we start to watch YouTube videos for hours on end or look through all your Snapchats. I don't have Snapchat, so I don't know how it works, but you start to look at all your Snapchats and you start to just kind of like waste time. And before you know it, you're like, wow, like an hour just went by and I don't even know how, but it's like gone like that. And when I'm trying to fill myself to get started for the day, instead of filling myself with the word of God first, I'm reaching for something else first. Or we're stressed out and we've got a lot of things going on, and so when we get home at the end of the day, the easiest thing is to turn on the TV and just drown everything else out. 
because it's easier to just focus on that and not focus on what you're dealing with. It's easier to just focus on something else where you can kind of, it's like that mind numbing, just kind of like watch the waves of the TV go by you. And you don't have to look at or feel or think about the pain and the emptiness that you're actually dealing with or the stresses of life that you're dealing with. Other times we look to things like alcohol or drugs or pornography or other substances that we can use to numb out how we're actually feeling and how we're actually doing so that we don't have to look at it. Because like I said, it hurts. It's hard. It doesn't feel good to feel like you're in a place of emptiness. It doesn't feel good when you're so hungry for something that you would eat anything just to pay, take that pain and discomfort away. It's not a comfortable place to sit in. It's so much easier and so much more of our natural reaction to fill that void and fill that pain and fill that emptiness on our own because it's so much easier than actually having to humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, I need you to fill this emptiness in me right now. I can't do this. I, I can, but it's not going to last. I want what you have for me that is going to last, that is going to be sufficient enough to sustain me so that I don't keep doing this, this repetitive thing of I fill myself and it's gone, and I fill myself and it's gone. I want your filling. I want your righteousness that I would not have to sit in a place of uncomfortable and lack again because you can fill me in a way that I never have to hunger and thirst again. But we first have to be willing to submit ourselves. It's like when a kid, as a kid, you're told, don't spoil your dinner. Who's ever heard that? Don't spoil your dinner. When your parents say that, they mean stop eating all of your Halloween candy and stop eating all of your junk food so that you can have enough room to eat your dinner. Because if you fill up on all the junk and then you sit down to a meal that's supposed to be the nourishment that your body needs to grow and develop and sustain you, but you're already full on all of the junk, there's no room to put anything else in. And you're like, what, I'm full. I can't possibly eat anymore. And yet the things that you're full on are things that go like that and leave your body feeling gross and leave your body feeling sugar dips, <laughs> sugar highs and sugar lows. It's things that aren't actually going to sustain you. It's things that aren't actually going to help you to grow and develop and to have energy. But you're filling up on that first. And then when, when we do that in the spiritual sense, when we fill ourselves up with all of the stuff that we think we need to fill ourselves up with, and then we go to God and say, okay, God, fill me. It's like, I can't. I can't give you my righteousness unless you're willing to come to me with emptiness. He wants to bless our emptiness, but it actually requires us to sit in the uncomfortable and take it to him that way. There's a TV show that I've watched since I was little. I've wa we watched this as a family growing up, and it's a reality TV show called Survivor. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the show. Um, they just started a new season, and I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> It's a show that's been on for quite a while, and the premise of this show is they take 20 to 30 strangers and stick them on a deserted island somewhere and basically tell them, figure it out. They have to figure out how to build their own shelter and make fire and get water and make food that they have to portion out and ration out over the course of 39 days that they're there. And throughout the show, people get voted off, and the goal is to be the last person standing in this show. Because if you're the last person standing who can outplay everybody else, you can outsmart everybody else and make it all the way to the end, if you can be the sole survivor, you get the title, but you also get a million dollars. Pretty awesome prize. So people, when they sign up for this show, they're locked in on, I'm, I'm not just coming on for the experience of Survivor, I want that million dollar prize. I want what's at the end of this. And so they're locked in. And I remember watching a few seasons back and it made me think of this, like what are we actually filling ourselves on? Because I watched this show where they're down to about five people and they get to a point where they have a challenge and the challenge, if you win it, you're safe from being voted out that night. You're guaranteed a one in four spot of winning a million dollars. So if you do compete in this challenge, 
you're safe, you can't be voted out. So they get down to where the host is and he's explaining what they're going to have to do and it's this feat of endurance where they're going to have to stand on these like two inch by two inch squares with just their feet and they're going to have to hold themselves up on a post and the last person standing wins safety that night. Can't be voted out. As they're walking into this challenge, they show like a one-on-one camera shot with this one guy who's one of the five last contestants. And he says on camera, I know if I don't win tonight, I'm getting voted out. I have to win this. I have to, or I'm going to lose. So he's admitted it out loud. He knows it's his name getting written down tonight. If I don't win this challenge, I'm out of the game. And they walk into the challenge and the host explains what they're going to have to do and explains the game that they're going to have to play. And then the host says, or if you'd like to take a seat over here in the shade, I have this pizza And for as long as everybody is standing over there doing the challenge, could take five minutes, could take two hours. As long as people are competing in this challenge, you just get to sit here, relax, watch, and eat your pizza. And in this man's state of being blinded by his own hunger, he goes, I'll take the pizza. I remember sitting there screaming at my TV like, what are you doing? As if that was going to change his mind at that moment. What are you doing? Like, that is the worst idea ever. You have guaranteed safety if you just fight for it. But you're going to sit down and eat a pizza? Like, it's probably not even that good. And because you haven't eaten carbs and dairy for like a month, you're probably going to throw it up later anyways. It's not going to be great for you. It's not going to end well. In the moment of eating it, it might taste good. But it's not going to end well. You're giving up guaranteed safety to eat a pizza. And I remember just having this thought as I was thinking through this sermon and thinking like, that's such a pivotal moment of what we do all the time to God. Because we're blinded by our own need, because we're, we can't see out of our own circumstance, and because we have so many endless options that are open to us, we often choose the thing we think we need when actually it's just the disguised barrel of fish that's going to be the thing that starves us and kills us. We often turn away from guaranteed safety, guaranteed righteousness, guaranteed joy, guaranteed fulfillment for a momentary filling that's only going to last so long. But we often do this to God all the time because we're blinded and we can't see what we need. And God's saying, stop. Would you see that what I have to offer is so much greater than what you could possibly take for a minute? I have so much more for you than what you could possibly gather and scrape and pull in and fill yourself with. I have more And all it requires is for us to humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, would you be what fills me? Would you be the thing that I can run to and turn to and say, God, I need your righteousness. I need your strength in this. I need your joy. I need your contentment. I need your peace. Would you be what fills me? Not my own self, but you. We have to be willing to turn to God and ask him, God, would you fill us? There's a story in John 6 um, where it's just talked about how Jesus has fed the 5,000. He's created, he's done this amazing miracle. He's fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. The people have seen him do this. They know who he is. They know what he's just done. And yet when Jesus moves on and, and leaves, the people go and seek after him to find him. And it picks up in verse 25 when it says, When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus is literally telling them in this moment, It's not the miracle you're looking for. Although that's why you came here to seek me out, to find me, to ask me, to perform another 
miracle to split the uh, clouds in the sky and rain things down and do another amazing, wonderful miracle. That's what you think you need in this moment. But what you actually need in this moment is the worker. You're seeking the miracle. You're praising the miracle. But what you actually need in this moment is the miracle worker. Because he's the one that's standing right in front of you, ready to continue to bless you. Carries on in verse 28 and says, Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answers, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent you. So they asked him, what signs will you give us? How can we believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. It is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is the Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And I love this, that it ends with, Jesus declared. So it's like all nice in the beginning of this, where it's like, Jesus said to them, Jesus answered them, Jesus said to them, and then it's like, Jesus declared. It's like this moment of like, are you listening to me? If you haven't already, I'm going to speak it a little slower and tell you, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus had to declare it to them. I am. It's like this moment where like kids are like, but why, mom? And the mom's like, because. But why? Because. But why? Because. And you watch it happen all the time. And it's, I used to be that kid, so I understand what the parent now feels on the other side of it. And it's like this moment of like, but why? Because, but why? Because, and that's what they're doing to Jesus. But how will we know Jesus? Because I am. But how will we know? Because I am. But how will we know? And he's like, because I am. Would you stop looking for the miracle and start seeing that the worker is in front of you? I am the bread of life. Worship team, you can come on up. I am what you need. I am what you seek. I am the bread of life that you need. I am the one thing standing right in front of you, ready to bless you with everything you need. If you would just choose to point your hunger at me, you would never hunger and thirst. I am. We need to stop looking for the sign and the wonder and the work and start looking for the worker. Because Jesus declared it to them that day, I am the bread of life. He's offering and willing to say, it's yours. If you would choose to humble yourself and come before the Lord and say, Lord, I need your righteousness to fill me today. God, I can't do it in my own strength. I need your strength to fill me today. If we're willing to submit ourselves in that way to God, he will come and fill us with his righteousness. And we can sit in a place that is never lacking we can sit in a place that is always full, where we don't have that urgency and that hunger in us anymore, where it's like, God, I just need you. Stop filling yourself with what we think we need to fill ourselves with and be willing to say, God, I'm gonna come to you empty, in a place of brokenness, in a place of hurt, in a place of lonely. I'm gonna to come to you, I'm gonna to submit to you, and I'm gonna say, God, I'm gonna stop filling myself and I'm gonna let you fill me. Because it's only then that he can actually enter into your circumstance. It's only then that he can actually fill us the way that we were meant to be filled. It's only then that we can actually have the joy of God that he wants to give us, that we can have the strength of God that he gives us. If we stop leaning on ourselves and lean on the worker that's in front of us, we can be filled and never hunger again. Never again would we hunger if we choose to submit ourselves to God, humble ourselves before him. D.L. Moody says this, I firmly believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride, selfishness, ambition, self-seeking, and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will come and fill every corner of our heart. 
when we stop seeking ourselves, God can fill every corner of our heart. He continues to say, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Church, he can't fill us if we come to the dinner table full. He can't fill us if we won't stop self-soothing and fixing our own problems and then coming to him and being like, God, why aren't you helping me? Where are you? Why aren't you filling me? He can't do anything unless we're willing to stop doing it ourselves and let him take control. And it requires us to be humble. It requires us to submit ourselves into a posture of humility and say, God, I need you. I need you to fill me because I can't do this anymore. I want to pray for us today. And as we pray, I want to pray for two people in this room. Because I think there's people in this room who are so set on the miracle that they forget that there's a miracle worker at hand. They're so set on seeking the sign, seeking the, the thing that's going to prove it to them, that God is there for them before they trust him, that they forget that Jesus is already in front of them, waiting and willing to do and to fill them so that they would never thirst or hunger again. And then there's also those in the room who, because it feels uncomfortable and because it's hard, you just keep filling yourself. And God's saying, stop. Would you stop? Stop filling yourself so I can be your life. Stop trying to eat that bread over there when I am the bread of life. When I'm the only thing you need, stop. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around this room, it's a moment between you and God of pure honesty, saying, God, I recognize that I've been seeking for you to prove it to me. I've been seeking for you to show me somehow so that I can trust you. And today I'm gonna stop seeking the miracle and I'm gonna start seeking the worker. Or if you're in this room and you're saying, Lord, it's going to be hard, but I'm going to trust you and I'm going to stop trying to fill myself. I'm going to let you fill me with your righteousness so that I can see and feel true fulfillment in my life where I don't long and hurt and ache anymore because I'm not trying to self-soothe myself into into knowing what it feels like to be full. But I have your bread of life in me, your righteousness filling me. If that's you today, if you're recognizing the need for Jesus to enter in your circumstance and help you, then I want you to just raise your hand. And again, it's nothing, this is between you and God. This is the raising your hand is just saying, I'm gonna be obedient in this. God, I'm going to stop self-filling. God, I'm going to stop seeking your miracles and I'm going to start believing your worker. It's a moment between you and God of just saying, God, I recognize my need for you today. Lord, we thank you that you are our ever constant fulfillment. God, that as we choose to turn our eyes towards you, as we focus our hunger towards you, that you are able to fill us the way no man, no thing, no earthly thing can fill us the way you can. And so God, we choose today to turn to you and say, Lord, would you fill me with your righteousness? God, I come to you empty. God, we come to you weak. We come to you broken. And we say, would you fill us with your righteousness. God, we come to you in a place of needing you. We come to a place of recognizing our need for you to fill us in this. Jesus, would you help us that it, not just today, but every day we would choose to need your righteousness over our ability to fill ourselves. God, would you continue to remind us daily to seek you, to chase after you, to long for you instead of longing for what we can do on our own. Jesus, would you be our fulfillment? We thank you, God. Amen.